Hello, church. I am uh, Doug Fauble. Uh, most of you know me. The last time I was here, Stan and Ann were sitting right over there. It was a Sunday evening, and we were kicking off spiritual gifts, uh, and not just the study, but the identification and use of them here. Uh, last night, I had to make a hospital call at St. Mary's, so I drove to Butterworth. And uh, I stopped to see Pastor Stan just briefly. Uh, his eyes are brighter than what I thought they would be. And uh, he is uh, recovering uh, well, just as you've heard. Uh, but what I noticed about him was not just the medical, physical, uh, but you know him even better than I. I know him as a colleague here in classes, Holland. Uh, but he's a man of God. And uh, uh, when we prayed together, that showed. And he has faith in Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you that he is well that way. So thanks for loving him and Anne and the family uh, during this time as well. When Harlan called and asked uh, if I could be here today, it's an honor to come back. Thank you for having me. And I want to pick up on the epiphany themes that uh, Noah and Kurt, they've organized and uh, Doug has highlighted as well with the children's message we're going to read in just a second. Uh, the rest of chapter 2. Uh, we've heard about in the children's message, uh, wise men magi coming, and then we're going to pick up our reading um, after they leave, and then what happens to Jesus? Where is Jesus anyway? That's a big question uh, in the Gospel of Matthew. It was there in the early church day, and it still is today. Uh, today's a huge day in the life of the Christian church around the world. Uh, this is the end of, uh, as Noah rightly said, uh, the 12 days of Christmas. We're wrapping up Christmas tide. The Eastern Church is celebrating Christmas uh, today and tomorrow. And when you go home, you will hear about a bombing of a Christian church in Cairo, Egypt. Uh, Egypt has the biggest, in terms of country, they have uh, more Christians there than the other uh, countries in the Middle East. And uh, continue to pray for the church around the world as well. But uh, this is their traditional Christmas celebration. It's a big, high, and holy day. It's epiphany for us, the manifestation or the showing, the appearance of the uh, Christ child to uh, not just uh, Mary and Joseph, but also the Gentiles and Magi coming from afar. It's a great mission emphasis Sunday. We're going to read a passage that is one of my favorites. Verse 23 in particular and I'll talk a bit about that uh, after we read together. Let's bow our heads in prayer before we do that. Lord our God, now as we turn to your word, we look forward to your speaking to us. Your dear church here at Grafscop, they've actually come expecting you, Jesus, to talk to them. Through the reading of the word, give us your Holy Spirit so that this passage of scripture comes alive again. And if somebody came in here today, Lord, and they don't know you as their personal savior from sin and Lord of life, we pray that you would give them your Holy Spirit as well, so that they too would come to saving faith in the one and only way to the Father, through you, Jesus. All of this we pray in the name of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. From Matthew chapter 2, and I'm going to read the pulpit Bible. We're going to start our reading at verse 13. And the, the they there uh, in verse 13 refers to the Magi who have left, and they did not go back to tell Herod where they, where's Jesus, where they found him, uh, but they went back because they were obedient to the will of God. Hear God's holy word as it's read from Matthew, from the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 2, starting at verse 13. Now, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. That's in contrast to what Herod said. He wanted to find the Christ child to worship him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet out of Egypt, I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious 
He sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old and under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah weeping in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, dream he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a city called Nazareth. So that was what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. Thus far the reading from God's holy word. Thanks be to him. Well, in this passage of scripture, we continue on looking at what happened after the wise men, the Magi, left. Jesus was now identified rightly as a child. Some months, at least some months, had, uh, had gone past since his birth and the angels said to the shepherds, go and worship the Christ child. And so the shepherds went and Jesus was a newborn baby uh, there in the manger. By the time the wise men come and they see the star that has been described so well here by Pat, they come and they want to find out where is the king of the Jews who has been born. I mean, where is Jesus? This is a high time of life for salvation history, but in the life of God's people then and for us today as well. I mean, chapter 1 already identifies the genealogy of Jesus. And Joseph was afraid to take Mary because she was with child. They hadn't come together as husband and wife. And so he wanted quietly. He was a good man. Uh, I mean, that's described in chapter 1. And he wanted to put her away quietly, not to shame her or embarrass her. But he was afraid to take her as wife. And he was a godly man, but he must have been afraid a bit. And so he receives the instruction from the Lord to take Mary and to name the baby Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. That's all in chapter 1. And the gospel writer Matthew wants to underscore that Je where is Jesus, the promised Savior? Well, he's right here. After all of this genealogy and the promise from one generation to the next, the time had fully come. Savior had been born. So where is Jesus? Well, he's right there with Mary and Joseph in the manger. That's his name, Jesus, which means Savior. So in chapter 2, that same theme of where is Jesus is highlighted. And so the Magi, the wise men, they come and they ask the logical question. Where is he who has been born king of the Jews in the first part of chapter 2? So where is Jesus? That's the question. Chapter 1, chapter 2. And so the wise men come and Herod is even interested, where is Jesus? You come back and tell me where he is so I can worship him. But then the wise men, they depart, they leave, as we've read, another way because they were warned in a dream by God not to go back because Herod didn't want to. He didn't really want to worship Jesus. He wanted to destroy the child. Now, Jesus was older now, maybe up to two years old, Herod thinks, because he has all the baby boys in Bethlehem and vicinity killed. Where's Jesus? Herod thinks maybe he's killed him, but... Where's Jesus? Well, Jesus now has fled with mom and dad, with his mother and father, to Egypt. And that's fulfilled the scripture. But there were people who were trying to kill Jesus. And the question is, where is Jesus to destroy him or kill him? Where can you find Jesus? So now he's down in Egypt. And the passage we read said, describes the coming back. He was going to go back to Bethlehem, but Joseph was afraid to go there when Archelaus was ruling instead of Herod. And Archelaus was even a worse person, murderer, than his father Herod. And Joseph, again, this, this trait of fear shows up. 
So he's afraid to go back to Bethlehem where Archelaus was, so he goes back up north to Nazareth, which is where they came from. Now that's an important twist in this Matthew 2 story because starting out in Matthew 1 and answer the question, where is Jesus? We would have all answered in Bethlehem. That's to fulfill the passage of scripture in Micah that said he's going to be born there in Bethlehem. So just go to Bethlehem. Where is Jesus? Go to Bethlehem. But then Matthew, in this surprise twist, at the end of chapter 2, describes Jesus not being in Bethlehem, but answers the question, where is Jesus? He's in Nazareth. And this was to fulfill not just one passage, but passages from the Old Testament, it looks like, so that the prophets could be fulfilled. So where is Jesus is really the question in Matthew 1 and Matthew 2, and it's the question for us yet today as well. Let's make sure we understand not just the text, and he will be called the Nazarene. I mean, historically, we could say he grew up there in Nazareth. This whole, this whole Nazareth, identification of Nazareth, tracked Jesus because when he was calling his disciples later on, why Philip goes to find Nathaniel, and he says, we found the promised Messiah in John chapter 1. Well, who is it? Where is he from? Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth. We found him. In John 1 verse 46 says the logical and expected answer to the question by one of the future disciples. Nazareth, not Jesus. John 1 verse 46, you can read it. What good can come out of Nazareth? Where is our Savior? Where is our Messiah? Where is our Christ? Nazareth? What good can come out of Nazareth? <laughs> and so this whole question of where is Jesus continued to come up. I mean, where is he? And Nazareth tracked Jesus all the way to the cross. In John 19, verse 19, there we read uh, Pilate, and he put the title, Jesus. And what? Not just Jesus, but Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. This whole business of Jesus and Nazareth connected is important. It's important because it fulfills the prophets. Matthew quotes the Old Testament often throughout the gospel showing how Jesus fulfilled scripture. What's fulfilled here? Well, if you're a veteran Christian and you want to look at the passages of Scripture, and sometimes they're footnoted in Bibles, and you can you look at the concordance as well. There's no particular verse that's put here in Matthew 2, verse 23, so that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. That is, from Nazareth, we think. There was a, a certain sect, a Nazarene sect, Nazar sect, that had a, a way of living and they didn't drink wine, those so forth. Probably that's not what was referred to here. What's referred to here picks up on not so much Nazareth, the name of a town that was very inconspicuous. It wasn't well known. What good could come out of a town that had maybe 500 or, or so people up to in, the, in the region of the, the uh, Galilee, Sea of Galilee? What good could come I mean, it wasn't Jerusalem. It wasn't a big shot town. It, there weren't a lot of people, well-known people from there. What good could come out of that? In fact, the people there in Jesus' day, many of them, especially those who mocked him, they went a step further than asking what good can come out. To be from Nazareth was a term of derision, to be despised, to be looked down on, to be rejected, to be with the lower or the lowest of the lower class. And so this passage of Scripture here in Matthew 2, verse 23, fulfills passages from the Old Testament like Psalm 22, verse 6, that he was despised by people. And especially Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. And the suffering servant there talking about he was despised, he was rejected. 
during the Christmas season, although uh, initially it was meant for Lent, the Messiah, Handel's Messiah is performed and many of you maybe sang in it and maybe you, you went to hear it or you saw it somewhere. And this is one of the themes or passages of the scripture. He was despised, he was rejected. And so the passages of scripture that were fulfilled here, sort of a combination of at least two or more. He will be called a Nazarene. Matthew was saying, not only was he from Nazareth, but he would be looked down upon and despised. If you're going to answer the question, where is Jesus? Jesus is going to be found in Nazareth, but he's going to be found in inconspicuous places at times as well. Not only in Jerusalem hanging on the cross, saving us from our sins, but he's going to be found with people who were looked down upon, who were marginalized, maybe who were orphaned, who were known as sinners. That's where you're going to find Jesus. You're going to find Jesus among people who have to come to faith in Jesus. That's where he's going to be found. He's going to be found by magi who come, wise men who come hundreds if not thousands of miles to worship the Christ child because they saw the star. Epiphany reminds us of the question and the answer, where, are, where is Jesus today? Where would you find Jesus? Where will you find Jesus? He's with people who not only have heard and know the Old Testament passages, but have to hear about the gospel and come to saving faith. This is a great Mission Sunday epiphany. This is a Sunday where people will go up and they will preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, that it's all about his grace, that we can enter territory where there are non-Christians. We can enter new years, new territory, knowing that Jesus is with us, just as Jesus, as an infant, as a child, was there with Mary and Joseph in Egypt and back, there in Bethlehem and then in Nazareth, with those people who were known as, yes, the lowlifes, the people who needed to hear the gospel, just like the disciples needed to say to one another and to others, we have found the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. And in answer to the question, what good can come out of Nazareth? All you have to do is you think about Jesus and what he did for you and for me and God's grace being shown to sinners. God's grace being shown to people who didn't deserve it but received the love of Jesus Christ. And this was shown especially starting in families. Jesus was with Mary and Joseph. And the wise men came to a family. And they came to that house where the child was with his mother and father. Where is Jesus today? Jesus can be found in our homes and in our families, caring for infant children as well as those who are older. We should never forget that the gospel of Jesus Christ is often, not always, but often heard for the first time in our homes. It's often heard by an 11-month-old infant son like Harvey for the first time from mom and dad in the house before he may even be able to speak a word hearing about Jesus in the house. And I'm not dreaming this up, it happens. I say this to a church of Jesus Christ as a preacher who heard the gospel for the first time and heard about Jesus for the first time from a Sunday school teacher at Hillcrest Chapel on the southwest side of Grand Rapids, Michigan, sponsored by Franklin Street Christian Reformed Church at that time, years ago. And I was baptized when I was 12. In the name that we sang about in the first song today, name above all names, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I want to come back to that because it's mentioned here in Matthew. At the end of Matthew, the answer to the question, where is Jesus, is covered again. And it's so important that Jesus picks up on that theme and he answers it without asking the question. And he says, you can go into all the world, all authority has been given to me. Jesus who was crucified, Jesus who was raised for our justification, ascended to heaven, sitting at the right hand of the Father, King of kings and Lord of lords, giving us the Holy Spirit so that we can have the courage to face another year, an opportunity of proclaiming the name of Jesus as Savior 
in asking and answering the question, not only for ourselves and others, where can you find Jesus? You can find Jesus in our homes. You can find Jesus here at Grafscop Church being proclaimed. And don't ever, ever forget that you can go forward and you can say, Jesus is my Savior and my Lord. And he can be your Lord and Savior as well. And instead of destroying him, avoiding him, or killing him, you can accept him as your Savior. In the ministry here at Grafscop Christian Reformed Church, Jesus is here through the Holy Spirit. Jesus is powerfully and courageously here. And now on this Epiphany Sunday, a pastor, a preacher who has been saved by grace through the ministry of a small chapel, what good can come out of a small chapel? What good can come out of a church like Grafscop that's been around for a long time and to many people may just be part of the community. What good can come out of here? I can tell you that because Jesus said, yes, I am with you always to the end of the age. Where is Jesus is a question that Matthew asked and answered Matthew 1, Matthew 2. And at the end of Matthew, it's the last verse in Matthew. I will be with you always to the end of the age. Church of Jesus Christ Christians, Epiphany Sunday, is a Sunday, not only that celebrates wise men coming, Gentiles coming to worship Jesus from afar years ago. It's a reminder of where is Jesus to be found today. And it's in this congregation, in our homes, and in our families, and in our marriages. That's the answer to the question. And if you, and when you go through times, where is Jesus when I'm going through surgery, when I'm going through recovery, when I'm going through terrible times of stress and marriage and working? Where is Jesus? I'm going to tell you, go back to this passage of Scripture. Remember, the answer to the question, where is Jesus? He could be found in Nazareth here in Matthew 2.23. 2, and he is with you always and he keeps his promises. Never to leave or forsake you, no matter what you go through. This is what this passage of scripture means for you and for me. Not just for the wise men, not just for Mary and Joseph, not just for when Jesus was an infant and a child. It's today. And I'm asking you the question now. Do you know Jesus as your Savior personally? Do you know that through the Holy Spirit, He is in you? He is in your house. He is at work with you. He is in your ministry. Do you know that personally? I pray that everyone here would say yes, because God loves you. That's why Jesus came. Don't miss Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that today we can come back to this passage of Scripture and we can read it and we can see not only what it meant back then, although, it, Lord, we thank you for the Gospels. We thank you for your grace shown to us and that there, in an inconspicuous, inconspicuous place, an out of the way place, a low class place, you showed your love. Not only to, Father, to your son Jesus, but you showed your love to us sinners. For we truly don't deserve your love in Jesus, but we thank you that you have shown us the way. We thank you that you continue to be with us through your Holy Spirit. And Jesus, we thank you for loving us today. Continue to give us your Holy Spirit. And may we never be ashamed of the gospel. May we always be courageous. And when we feel fear just like Joseph did, may you always come back to us and remind us of your presence and your power, not just for one day or one week or one event, but for eternity. All this we pray in the powerful name of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen.